had a drum here, Michael, I would totally sit and pound on it like a dude. Really? You would uh, defy convention and tradition? They say women aren't supposed to ever sit at the drum. You have to stand behind us. The man's place. Have a seat at the drum. Yeah, I don't care about any of that. I don't either. I'm not big on traditions. No. It's going to be really weird when we're at that conference. Why? Because I was thinking, like we were talking this morning about how, uh, um, well, you were kind of saying more of it than I was about our ancestors being such crappy parents, how they didn't, how, you know, the, the history, the, the, the narrative, the story that we tell is that back in the days, the grandfather's mean old racist government came into our loving communities and our loving homes with parents and grandparents and extended family. We lived in harmony with nature. But then the racists came and ripped the children away and forced them into the boarding schools and forced them to speak English. They weren't allowed to speak Ojibwe. Yeah, no, sh no duh. Don't swear on my show. I won't swear. Um, and by the way, it's our show, not my show. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you ever hear of an immersion school? You go to an Ojibwe immersion school, they don't allow you to speak English. Boarding schools didn't allow you to keep speaking your... Ojibwe or Dakota, they were trying to immerse you in English. And yeah, guess what? That was super tough, elite. You know, the people who actually graduated from boarding schools left with a pretty advanced education, um, college ready. They were, um, they had trades. You know, boarding school grads did well for themselves. Uh, but the one thing missing was the development of character. Yeah, you can blame the white people. Oh, they still like our culture. Well, the problem is the generation before the boarding schools survivors didn't do well by their children. They didn't protect them. And, you know, school's only 12 years. You know, the story is that was long enough for the children to forget Ojibwe and that their parents and grandparents didn't bother to learn English so they could communicate with their children. There was this generation, you know, I read a book once about, um, what do they call it? Letters from boarding school. And how the letters were unread because they were written in English. Well, what's the matter with you guys? These are your children. You didn't bother to... So crappy parenting. The, the family was destroyed with no resistance from the elders, from our ancestors. And then they, the boarding school survivors, went on to have dysfunctional families of their own and not pass on the culture, the language, values, nothing. They just became workers. They became regular automatons like every Joe Schmo on the street. Oh! You know, our community, there's no community. You know, and that's why. You know, are you a member of the tribe? Are you enrolled in this, um, what do you call that? Smiling girls and rosy boys coming by my little toys. Monkeys made of gingerbread and sugar horses painted red. Richmond's children running fast, their fathers dressed in holes. Golden hair and mud of many acres on their shoes. 
Hazing eyes, running wild, past the stocks and over styles, kiss the window, merry child, come and buy my toys, come and buy my toys, come and buy my toys. You watch your father plow the fields with a ram's horn. And sewed it white with peppercorn, unfurled with a bramble thorn. Now your watching's over, you must play with girls and boys. Leave the parsley on the stool, but come and buy my toys. Come and buy my toys. Come and buy my toys. My, my toys Come and buy my toys You shall own a cambric shirt You shall work your father's land But now you will play in the market square until you become a man Come and buy my toys Come and buy my toys The white people are wankers, but we were colonized by wankers I don't hate the English, I hate the Ojibwe <laughs> Paraphrasing, uh, what was that movie? Train spotting. Yeah. That's the way the Scottish feel about the English. You're just colonized by them. <laughs> but anyway, what are we talking about? Well, the conference. Yeah. Are they going to expect me to sound like Tony Troyer and talk about how important it is? to learn the language, and if you don't learn the language, you're not a real Indian. <laughs> yeah, you're not a real Indian if you don't speak the language. What are you then? I don't know. I think Tony would say you're a descendant of Indians rather than a real Indian. A real Indian? Yeah, get on your spotted pony and ride in a loincloth. Go hunting for buffalo with a spear. He's a real Indian. Hi y'all! Hi, how are ya? Um. Anyway, so what's your theory on 9/11? I think the band Supertramp had something to do with 9/11. Supertramp? You mean when I was young, it seemed that life was so wonderful, oh beautiful, oh it was magical, something or other. Yeah. Why would you say such a thing? Well, I'll show you. Here's my theory on... I don't think Supertramp, the band, had anything to do with... I don't know if planes actually flew into those buildings or if there were drones or what that was. Um, but there was something weird going on with that album. Check this out, Emily. So, this is the uh, album Breakfast in America. Everyone's seen it, million hits off it, great band. Um, and what is it? It kind of looks like um, New York City. Right. It looks like New York City and the Twin Towers from the I think it was a 70s album. But you get closer and you realize, nope, it's breakfast stuff. There's a salt shaker and a glass of orange juice and a bunch of, you know, we sunny, we gamig stuff, restaurant stuff. And she's a waitress. So it's a waitress. And she's posed like the Statue of Liberty. Because she's standing outside of New York. She's a Statue of Liberty waitress. 
holding orange juice right in front of the Twin Towers. Now, if you flip this backwards, you'll notice that orange juice touches the numbers 9 and 11. Oh, <laughs> it totally does, right? And 9-11 touch the Twin Towers. And I didn't notice this for 20 years, but it's not just her standing there. It's a picture from an aero airplane window. Oh, wow, it totally is. That picture is taken from one of the hijacked planes. It's, and it's breakfast in America. They did that at like 9 o'clock in the morning, Central Time. It's about 8 o'clock New York time, breakfast time. And it's a blue sky, just like 9-11. So... My theory is Osama bin Laden was lead singer of Supertramp. That's the only logical explanation. We finally got to the bottom of that. Yeah. What about Tower 7? Oh, the third building that dropped exactly like the, those first two that had planes fly into them? And if you ever see, like, a plane crash on, like, a landing pad, you know, there's videos of it all over the place. In 2001, not many people had seen video of a plane crashing. But you realize just how flimsy planes are. They're made out of aluminum. And they blow up and disintegrate. If a plane slammed into a, a skyscraper... The cement skyscraper wouldn't just pulverize into dust. That has to be pulled. <laughs> yeah, totally. So the official story obviously isn't true. And the news and the mainstream narrative and most people who've been brainwashed or their brains have been, they're asleep or whatever, they keep forgetting that Tower 7 went down too. Nobody talk. We'll never, never, you know, never forget was the slogan. And people immediately forgot that three buildings fell when two planes were hijacked in New York. And then a third plane flew impossibly into the Pentagon at the same time. And the fourth plane that was supposed to hit that Tower 7, I think, is the one that ended up in a field in Pennsylvania or something. And again, because it... It behaved like a real plane. When it hit the ground, it pulverized into dust when it exploded and left, you know, just a charred remains and a bunch of rubble. If planes ran into buildings, they would either just bounce off or just blow up. It wouldn't have. And people either, that's either obvious, and it wasn't obvious to me at the time. I was you know, saddened by that day and was worried about stuff. But now, it's just like the moon landing. People are either awoke, awake, and they see the new, they see the new evidence when people challenge the official story and point out. I mean, you don't even have to have any special information. You can just question the mainstream narrative and go, that makes no sense. Obviously, 9-11 wasn't 